Hello, I'm Enrico Masovero, and this is an overview of multi-scale simulations of concrete degradation. This is a good time to talk about such simulations because we are facing an aging infrastructure which is reaching the limit of the service lifetime, and we are facing the, the, the issue of either deciding to extend the service time of these structures, keep using them, or reusing recycling concrete where possible, or safely disposing of concrete which may also be contaminated meanwhile. Another challenge we are facing is that when building with new concrete, we want to use new unconventional concretes which are intrinsically more sustainable. But in both cases, we are facing the fact that we want to predict long-term um, performance of structures for conditions or compositions that we are not familiar with, so we don't have long-term experimental data, and we want to extrapolate just the result of short-term experimental data, which is what we can get. So, most multi-scale modeling and simulation is a method, is a way to try and build more confidence and reduce the uncertainty linked to these timely extrapolations. In this talk in particular, I'm going to focus on chemomechanical processes degrading the mineral phases in concrete. So, I am excluding purely mechanical processes, such as fatigue, for example, or processes involving the rebar, like corrosion. But out of the many processes that do affect the minerals, let me just uh, briefly introduce sulfate attack as an example. In sulfate attack, you have sulfate ions penetrating from the exterior into the pore structure of the concrete, diffusing into it, reacting with calcium and aluminium in the concrete, and this is producing, on one hand, soft phases like gypsum, which is directly weakening the structure of the material, but also expansive phases, namely etringite, which is creating local pressure that may damage the material. So, more this kind of process, diffusion, reaction, expansion or damage, are common to all these various degradation modes. And what I want to do in this talk is not to specifically focus on one degradation mode in particular, but rather look at the common aspects of all the, mo the modeling of all these processes. So, if we want to look at commonalities, there are three processes that are common to all degradation modes. One is the transport of mass, like the diffusion of ions we said before, but also it could be the viscous flow of the solid. Then there are the chemical reactions that may either directly change the local composition or structure, like uh, gypsum before, or that may generate pressure that then can induce a local expansion. And, for example, the etrangite that we put in the example of the sulfate. And then there is the mechanical response, process number three, the mechanical response of the material to these local changes, which may lead to damage, cracks, which then in turn may change diffusivities, and so these three processes are all coupled together. So the aim of this talk, the first part of this talk at least, is to look at these three processes across the length scales, how they are modeled across the length scales from molecular to macro scale. And I've selected five representative length scales. The macroscale continuum is where concrete, we are mostly familiar with it, this is where we model concrete as a continuous porous medium. Then if we zoom in at the centimeter level, then we can start to resolve individually aggregates, interfacial zones, the cement matrix is still seen as a continuum porous continuum, and then we can also resolve explicitly cracks. If we then want to resolve the individual phases composing the cement paste as well as the capillary pores in it, we go into the micro scale, and hundreds of micrometers. And then if we want to focus further and observe how uh, each of these phases has its own morphology, think in particular, for example, of the CSH gel, which is also its inner gel porosity, which cannot be resolved at the micro scale, then we push further down into the nano to micro mesoscale. And finally, if we want really to resolve and to see how each phase individually is behaving or each interface between different phases is behaving, then we can look atom by atom in uh, molecular simulations at the molecular scale. So, summing up this talk, the first part which I'm entering now will be to look at how the three processes, mass transport, chemical reactions and mechanical response are modeled at each specific length scale that I've listed in the previous slide. And then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to show uh, some uh, examples of applications of works that are in the literature where these simulations at different scales have been combined in true multiscale efforts. And then I'll draw some conclusions. So let's start at the molecular scale. Here each atom is simulated individually as it moves around in the simulation box. And this movement is dictated by Newton's law of motion.
uh, where forces, interaction forces, cause accelerations, which cause velocities, which cause displacement. There's also a term adding or contributing to the velocity, which is linked to the temperature, as statistical mechanics teaches us. These are governing equations. They apply to any atom irrespective of their nature. Then what changes from an atom type to another is how they interact. So these interaction forces are typically obtained from interaction potentials, and these interaction potentials are specific to each kind of atom. So this is the constitutive aspect, if you want, of these simulations. Now, if you track the motion of the atoms, you reconstruct all the three main processes we are interested in. Mass transport is simply the motion of atoms from one part of the box to another one. Chemical reactions is the rearrangement of atoms forming a molecule into a new type of topology forming a different molecule, displacement still. And the mechanical interactions are tracked throughout the simulation by knowing the interaction forces at each time. So the three processes at this scale are intrinsically combined in these governing and constitutive equations. However, these kind of simulations are rarely used for concrete degradation, simply because the entire process of degradation it takes length and time scales that are far too large to be covered with molecular simulations. So what simulation, what these kind of simulations are used for is to look into the details of certain aspects that can provide some insight on mechanism or on parameters that we can use to better understand the overall process, like ion exchange at the interface between pore solution and ASR gel, in this example here, or how in detail the carbonation mechanism occurs between CO2 and calcium hydroxide in cement. Moving to the other side of the spectrum instead, where we can capture the entirety of degradation mode, here is the realm of continuum mechanics, and that's where the governing equations for uh, mass transport are those of mass conservation. So these kind of equations here are telling you how solid mass moves as well as pore solution and ions in it move. Also, in these equations, there are terms, sink or source terms, that account for change of quantity of different phases in the space. In other words, the temporal change of a phase is linked to local chemical reactions. So these are equations of reactive transport, which account for two of the processes we are interested in. The third one, mechanical response, has to do with linear momentum conservation, which links stress state with pore pressures and with external forces. Notice that all these equations are coupled together, have to be solved simultaneously, because, for instance, the pore pressure here is linked to the saturation level in these other equations there. Now, how do you particularize these governing equations to certain degradation modes? It's again through constitutive models and constitutive parameters. For example, for the mechanics, you link the state of stress with the state of strain through stiffness matrices, which depend on what your material is made of, as well as imposed eigenstrain that can come from creep, from chemical reactions, from temperature changes. In terms of chemical reactions, the rate, so the evolution of that m dot uh, element for in the reactive transport equation is linked to rate equations that often feature some indicators of concentration of reactants and k, which is an effective rate constant which accounts for all the morphology underlying your continuum representation, so the microstructure, as well as all the chemical reactions that can take place simultaneously to determine a macroscopic effect, such as the formation of ettringite, for example. You also need constitutive equations for the mass transport part, so something that has to do with the flux of the solution as well as diffusion of ions into it. So you need to have all these additional bricks into your model, and each of these involves parameters that naturally provide a docking point to couple the macroscale models with smaller scale models that can inform all these constitutive uh, um, inputs. In terms of applications, there's a long history for this kind of models, dating back 50 years ago. And with these models, you can simulate the fully coupled process, like here for sulfate attack. This is a simulation of diffusion, coupled with chemical reactions with this rate we saw before, coupled with expansion imposed by ettringite and damage in black here. Also, this kind of method, the same constitutive equations and the same type of governing equations are applied at the smaller micro to macro mesoscale, 
where aggregates and cracks are resolved explicitly. The difference there is that instead of just using finite elements on a uniform domain, Typically, you couple, you apply these equations to richer descriptions that may involve discrete particles or a lattice uh, element or a lattice elements overlaid so that you effectively simulate diffusion through these channels that can change their local diffusivity based on the cracks. So you have a richer, more heterogeneous description of your system, but still the governing and constitutive equations are the same as you see in macroscale models. The natural place to inform the constitutive models at the macro scale is at the smaller intermediate scales between molecular and macro. And starting from the micro scale, so 1 micrometer to 1 millimeter, here is where you want to simulate the temporal evolution of the different phases in the cement microstructure. So here CSH in yellow, CH in red, pore uh, fluid in blue, and unreacted phases in grey. So you want to see how these evolve during cement hydration as well as when in contact with other chemicals such as sulfates. So this software, like the NIST code suite or Heimostruct and Mike, these are well established, many people use them, and I don't have time to give you the details of those, but there are two aspects that I would like to highlight and discuss. First of all, consider the NIST codes. In order to simulate reactive diffusion, they use cellular automata. In a cellular automaton, you start from your simulation box, you divide it into cubic cells, and in each cell there can be a different amount of different species, CH, CSH, solutions with ions, etc. These species can move from one cell to another one according to a random walk with a certain probability. And this is the diffusion. Whereas for the reaction, they, within each cell there can be chemical reactions changing the balance between phases, again according to other given probabilities. These probabilities are not assigned through a fundamental rule that, have, that, that encapsulates certain physics, so it's not a bottom-up uh, expression for them. Rather, you are tuning them in order to match correctly what you expect as an average process at a larger scale. So the result is that you get a model that is consistent with macroscopic models, but at the same time it gives you more fluctuation, more heterogeneity, is richer at the microstructural level and consistent. But it's not a rigorous upscaling, so it, when you want to apply this to new compositions and to phenomena that you haven't tested experimentally first, there is always a bit of uncertainty lying on this heuristic nature of these models. The second aspect I want to highlight has to do with mechanics, because in these models, Mechanics and uh, microstructural evolution are not fully coupled, but the finite element, usually a finite element mesh for the mechanical response, is plugged on top of the result of uh, reactive diffusion chemical transformations. To understand what I mean with these, consider these out of the three examples I selected, consider this one for sulfate attack. Here they use Thames, one of those cellular automata codes from NIST, to hydrate and create a model microstructure of a cement paste, then expose it to a certain amount of sulfate ions. As a result of these, some sites turn into ettringite, so some of these cells, and then you take this microstructure with the ettringite, you plug on it a finite element mesh, and wherever there is an ettringite element, you apply a 20% expansive eigenstrain to simulate the ettringite expansion, and you simulate with FEM the mechanical response to that. Then you go back to your microstructure before any mechanical response, you add more sulfate to see more sulfate attack, you create a new model microstructure with ettringite, plug in FEM, see the new mechanical response. But you can see two limitations with this. First, you don't have a feedback loop where the mechanical transformation change your chemical reactions. Although there is at least one work I can think of where they did have this feedback loop to some extent. But the more important, the more fundamental issue in my view is that mechanics and chemistry are not coupled in the sense that the rate of chemical reaction producing ettringite is not affected by the stress state that is predicted by the FEM simulation. So the coupling is not full between chemistry and mechanics here. If you want to find simulations instead where you can achieve a full coupling, you can look at the lower scale, nano to micro mesoscale. This is where uh, each process, so our diffusion, uh, mass transport, chemical reactions and mechanical response, they can be coarse-grained rigorously from results at the molecular scale. So there is a strong connection with the molecular scale here, bottom-up. 
So starting with diffusion, one way of coarse graining diffusion rigorously is via the lattice Boltzmann method. So the idea of lattice Boltzmann is that the molecules, groups of molecules in a molecular simulation, will move during diffusion according to two processes. One is conservation of momentum, which gives a streaming effect that moves atoms according to a current momentum. But then there are collisions between atoms and molecules, which tend to redistribute the velocities in the fluid in such a way that it tends towards a certain equilibrium distribution of velocities. This equilibrium distribution is known for certain systems through statistical mechanics, and this is given by the Boltzmann equation, Boltzmann distribution. This Boltzmann distribution depends in turn of the interaction forces that exist between the molecules. And this is the constitutive element of the model, because depending on the molecules you have, depending on the fluid type, you have different interaction forces, which can be related through this phi effective mass function to the equation of state. So in other words, from the thermodynamics of your fluid, you can work out the Boltzmann distribution, which informs the collision step, and essentially you get a system that represents how atoms and molecules molecules actually move in that fluid at the larger coarse-grained level on a cubic lattice, uh, similar to the one that you would have in a cellular automaton. In, you can also include sink and source terms in this to take into account for chemical reactions. However, the issue is that the more you go towards complex fluid, multi-phase interaction with solid um, surfaces and sink source reactive terms, the more you have to resort to heuristic expressions for interactions and Boltzmann distributions, and the more you end up with a model that is less fundamental and more uh, empirical. And this is maybe why uh, one of the reasons why these models actually have not been used yet at the nano to micro mesoscale, but they are rather used at the micro scale, so coupled with those NIST and other microstructural simulators I showed you before. So for diffusion, we have Lattice Boltzmann. For mechanical response, we can reconstruct coarse grain interactions using the potential of mean force. Now, I'm not going to give you the details, I'm just giving you an idea of how this works. Consider this molecular simulation of two particles of calcium silicate hydrate immersed in water, liquid water, with calcium ions dispersed into it to mimic a cement pore solution. Now, if you run a molecular simulation of this, you can compute at each time step the total energy of this system of two interacting particles. And you can plot this total energy as a function of distance between these two particles, as I've done here. Now, this becomes an effective interaction potential that you can use at a larger scale, where instead of resolving each atom, you consider just a cluster of them to be a particle, a nanoparticle. So there is a bit more to it. We have to invoke partition functions, etc. But this is kind of the idea of how you can rigorously coarse grain interactions from molecular simulation into a nano to micro scale simulation. Now, most of the work that you will see in the literature starting from 10 years ago on nano to micro simulations of cement is on mechanical interactions and mechanical properties constructed in this way. There is, uh, if you are more in interested in more results, you can look at this literature review, which I've co-authored. It's the best one you can find because it's the only one that has been published so far. And uh, there is also one thing that I want to note is that not only there has been chem in mechanical interactions between particles of solid, but there has been also work taken into account of how you can build in also the pore pressure in the gel pores as an additional contribution to the stress state and to the interaction forces. But still, it's very mechanics-based. The third process we want to coarse grain is chemical reactions. And for chemical reactions, we can invoke transition state theory, for example. So in transition state theory, you start from the assumption, from the model, that if you look at the, at the system at the molecular level, some molecules will be in the reactant state, some molecules will be in the product state, and some molecules will be, if you just take a picture, a, 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 a snapshot, some molecules will be in an intermediate state called transition state or activated complex. So assuming that these three states are in quasi-equilibrium conditions, you can work out from statistical mechanics, there is a good guide in this book here from La Saga, you can work out these expressions for the reaction rate. And there are a few things I want to uh, highlight here. All this expression here is made of terms, energies and concentrations which you can obtain from a molecular simulation in principle. Not easy, but you could. Also, if you cluster all these terms together, 
and you call this k like the rate constant, what you're left here is this q term, which is the activity product, which is a measure of the concentration of ions in solution of reactants. So we are back to what we know macroscopically as the law of mass action, k times concentrations we saw before in the macroscopic models, but this time k is exploded in all its contributions. Also, one important contribution is this delta U here, which is a measure of the mechanical interaction of the local stress state. So these rate equations are intrinsically dependent on local stress. They are coupled. There is a coupling between rate of chemical reaction and local stress, which is the issue that we didn't have at the micro scale. Of course, this rate constant is not something you can use directly in the macroscopic simulation because this is at the molecular level still. We need to then apply this to a morphology at the microstructural level to obtain something usable at the macroscopic level. Applications of transition state theory in nanoparticle-based simulations is something that I've been working on in the past five years or so, because until then, the only way in which this transition state theory was used in uh, simulations that included the morphology of crystals was in the field of earth sciences where these reaction rates were sampled using kinetic Monte Carlo. So my contribution from the few uh, past years has been to also include in a particle-based simulation with PMF interacting particles, potential mean force, also include the possibility for particles to dissolve or to precipitate according to TST rates using kinetic Monte Carlo. So with these kind of simulations, I've been able to address processes where mechanical stress, mechanical interactions, and chemical reactions are strongly coupled. For example, here, the precipitation of calcium silicate hydrate nanoparticles heterogeneously on top of each other, driven by, it chemical, by mechanical interactions. Or here, you can see the solution in an allied crystal occurring at the tip of a screw dislocation and driven by the fact that there is a stress concentration in there predicted by the interactions between the particles. Or here, you see a crystal, in this case of Portlandite, in between two platens of metal of steel, where I apply a small vertical force in between the two platens, and as a, result, as a result of this, there is a local stress distribution which increases the solubility of the particles under high stress. These particles dissolve, recrystallizing at the edges of the crystal, and this redistribution of material leads effectively to a creep deformation that is driven by pressure and dissolution. And finally, a recent application of this method, we, are, we, we, we have now a paper under review where we are considering multiphase system where CSH and calcium hydroxide can react with dissolved CO2 and produce calcium carbonate in yellow here. So summing up what we have seen here scale by scale, we started with the molecular scale and we saw that the three processes of mass transport, chemical reactions and mechanical response are all driven by displacement of atoms through simple constitutive and governing equations. However, these are limited. At the macro scale, you can capture all the coupling of all the degradation processes, but you need to inform them heavily through constitutive models. And if you want to inform these constitutive models, in turn, you can look at these intermediate scales where there is a mix of top-down and bottom-up approaches that are still have unresolved issues. They are still some, in some aspects in their infancy, but they provide a possible connection between the fundamental and the engineering land scales. Now, in the next part of this talk, what we are going to see is how simulations at different scales have been used uh, in some cases uh, in the literature. There are two ways of passing information across land scales. One is to start from a small scale model, run a simulation there, obtain some results that become a constitutive load that is plugged into the macro simulation and then the macro simulation is run separately. The other way is to have a full dynamic coupling where the macro simulation transfers, passes state variables such as local deformation to the small scale simulation. This becomes a boundary value problem that provides some rate of change, so some tangents that become the constitutive equation incremental for the macro model and the loop is repeated with both models evolving together. Well, the second approach has not been implemented in concrete degradation models, and the main issue is that there are many state variables to pass. It's not just strain, there is also volume fraction of each phase, uh, interfacial area between all possible interfaces, so it becomes extremely complicated and time-consuming to run these two simulations at the same time in all points of the domain.
Starting with the results, we have seen that there are rigorous coarse graining methods to transfer information from molecular scale to the just larger mesoscale. We have discussed about potential of mean forces, and most of the work in the field has been done on potential of mean forces. Another set of quantities that could be coarse grains are thermodynamic and kinetic constants for chemical reactions, but there's little work on that because it's a very difficult topic actually to address. One example of a similar work to this is this work on where interactions between water and CSH surfaces have been used to then model capillary pressure at the larger scale and their effect on the local stress state. For diffusivity instead, diffusion properties, uh, we'll talk about it in the next slide. In this slide, we see some examples of simulations, multi-scale simulations of diffusion and leaching. So for calcium leaching here, in this work, there is a macro-scale simulation of water diffusion. The diffusive diffusion coefficients are obtained from a microstructure but constructed using one of those NIST codes we saw before for the microstructure. But then this is taken as a static input it's never touched anymore, and the rest of the process is all resolved at macro scale. Also, the leaching process is not simulated anymore at the micro scale, but is resolved at a larger scale through thermodynamic modeling. So it's really just a starting point, the microstructure in this example here. Coming towards more modern applications, here we see an example of diffusion where both the microstructure and the mesostructure have been modeled using the NIST code SEMID3D. Also in this case, they were used to create initial structures, compute the local diffusivity in this structure, but then the larger structure was mapped onto an FEM mesh so that you could apply tension, generate cracks, and then compute diffusivity on this cracked medium. So you get an heterogeneous distribution of the diffusion front. However, in these simulations here, once again, the uh, microstructural simulations are just to provide starting point. The rest is all resolved at a larger scale through continuum-based method, essentially. And also, in this case, there are no chemical reactions taken into account. Other simulations of diffusion multiscale I've targeted instead the scales that are below the microscale. So in this work here, we, they start, the authors start from a representation of the CSH gel. They use this one to simulate diffusion via random walk, and the diffusion constant is used in a microstructural simulation at the larger scale with the NIST code to get the diffusion coefficient for chloride. But there are no binding mechanisms, and there's no mechanics in this work here. In this other work here, more interesting, it starts from the molecular scale, uses it to parameterize diffusivity diffusivities to give at the interfacial point between solid and solution at the mesoscale here, and then these are imported as diffusivities as inputs for individual voxel cells at the microscale. In this case, they used lattice Boltzmann, but also in this example, there are no chemical reactions and there is no mechanical response of the system. So all these works that we have seen on diffusion and leaching are certainly limited on the mechanical aspect and the coupling between chemistry and mechanics. There are, however, some works that did look into mechanics during degradation. For example, here for alkali silica reaction, this is an interesting example because the loop is closed. So the mesoscale simulation provides input to the macro scale, which provides state variables back. So there is a, actually an example of full coupling, which is obtained via a condensation method called Fe square, finite element squared. But what is important here to notice is that there is no chemistry really. So it's only just a mechanical simulation because at the smaller scale, ASR expansion is imposed as an eigenstrain. The effect of this eigenstrain is brought to the larger scale, which feeds back the state of deformation, but there is no real chemical reaction or uh, diffusion process taking place here. In this work here, where I've been a co-author together with colleagues at Northwestern University and Politecnico di Milano, what we have used is semi-D3D as a way to obtain full constitutive equations for degree of hydration over time, phase composition, water content, chemical shrinkage. So we obtain the number of parameters from a single static simulation. So it's a bit of a it's a bit more than just providing an initial configuration. We provide temporal functions, but these were fixed and they informed processes such as um, self-desiccation at the larger scale. What we didn't do here is closing the loop and having this feedback, which I have already mentioned a few times, is very challenging. 
And finally, this example here is interesting because it does couple diffusion mechanics and microstructural evolution, so chemical reactions, but it does it on this 1D model where there is essentially a series of microstructures with the diffusion of sulfate ions through them and other ions too. And what the model is doing is it diffuses each element here, each square is actually, this cube is a one microstructure and based on the current uh, um, concentration of ions in solution that is resolved through a macroscale conservation equation, you work out what is the local amount of solvent, it is made to react with the microstructures, the microstructure is evolved and it produces a feedback back to the large structure in terms of diffusivity. So diffusion and microstructural evolution are coupled Mechanics is not really coupled in the sense that whenever at, at, at some certain instance during the diffusion process this array of microstructures is extracted and FEM is overlaid on top of that to obtain elastic and strength properties. But this is an interesting example of having at least all the three processes coupled via a combination of different scales. Coming to a brief conclusion now, we have seen that there exists a workflow connecting simulations at the microstructural level up through the mesoscale and to the macroscale where continuum methods are used, so a way to inform constitutive models for these larger models through microstructural simulations. However, this coupling, this information transfer is one-directional, there is no full dynamic coupling, and the reason lies in the complexity uh, and the number of state variables when we are dealing with concrete degradation processes. When we want to deal with new concretes or new exposure conditions, it becomes particularly important that our microscale simulations and microstructure evolution is informed from more fundamental land scales that can be more predictive for the, the processes that are taking place. This is desirable, and there is some work showing that this connection is possible, also in this case is one directional. But one limitation that we have highlighted at the micro scale is that the coupling between chemical reactions or reactive diffusion and mechanical evolution is quite weak. One way to improve it, there are possible ways to do that, but one that I am currently pursuing is to try and improve the coarse graining of those kind of coupled chemomechanical models I've showed you for the nano to micro mesoscale. And this is, I showed you this video already of pressure induced this, uh, creep. Well, in my team there is current work trying to uh, further cross grain these to directly address with these methods also the micro scale. And this is a video we obtained today where you can see at the 50 micrometer level a domain of calcium silicate hydrate with calcium hydroxide crystals and the crack that is healing out of carbonate precipitation from potlandite dissolution. So in this way we are starting to bring the full capabilities of chemomechanical coupling of particle-based simulations indeed to the microstructural level. So with this I thank Rylem, I thank Professor Suranani and Scrivener for their kind invitation and I'm happy to take questions.